Good morning, everybody. How you doing out there this morning? So glad that you are joining me on the Unfiltered radio show right here on 93.3. My name is Jason Gazak. I'm a pastor out in St. Clair, Missouri with to a church called Roots Church. I love my job. I don't even consider it a job, honestly, man. This is just an unbelievable opportunity that I have to lead people into some hope into their life. I also am a business owner. I've had my business for 27 plus years. I do deck building and fence. We build decks and fencing, actually. It's called The Deck Doctor. So I have a lot going on uh, in my on my plate here. And I know that, you know, usually, if you don't know what this radio show is about, it's really a platform for me to be unfiltered from a pastor's perspective to talk about social, political, and biblical topics. The one thing I don't want to do is always talk about political things because it's not all about politics. I also don't want to talk about all the social things out there because it can be very discouraging when you're talking about social things or political things. I also want to bring biblical perspective. I want to bring things that are going to give hope and and encouragement. Last week I did a rant, and it was a hard rant, but it is exactly how I felt, and it's exactly what I think people need to do. If you missed the rant, you need to go to my YouTube page at Jason Gazak. Follow me. Subscribe to my YouTube page. I don't have a lot of followers right now, and I don't really care about having— I would love a bunch of people to follow me, but that's not why I do it. I'm trying to get information out to people to encourage them, to get them thinking. Well, I don't have all the answers. I, I think sometimes I, I feel like I might have the answer, but it doesn't mean I have the answer. The reality is this. I don't want to be a Debbie Downer every week. I don't want to talk about things that are not encouraging every week. And I believe there are a lot of radio show uh, people, podcast people, uh, news people, whatever you want to call them, uh, influencers, that they do bring a lot of great things. But a lot of them are just fear mongering, uh, you know, just trying to rile you up in a way to bring fear more than to actually give you information to help you make better decisions and to be a better person or an American, or whatever it is. I mean, I think we need to be educated on what's going around the world, what's going on around the world. There is absolutely no no doubt. And as we continue to see what is going on in our country and around the world, I, I don't want to be negative about it. I actually, it reminds me that I do have hope and peace about a lot of things because God is in my life. It doesn't mean that I don't care, of course. It doesn't mean that I don't trust God. It, I absolutely trust God with everything, but while I'm trusting him, I'm also going to do all I can to get the word out. I'm going to do all I can with my voice. Um, that's that's my goal. I feel like part of my job, part of my calling in life is to share my thoughts and to share biblical truth to the things that we face daily. Again, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I don't like to talk about things and give you an answer to something. Uh, So I I research that and I look for the answer. I'm going to talk about this uh, in the first segment. We're going to talk about confirmation bias here in just a minute because I think confirmation bias, it can really mess us up. But either way, I do feel like there's a calling in my life to share my thoughts, to bring biblical truth to the things that we face daily. Um, I'm, my job is to really more importantly, get us thinking about whatever that topic is and getting you to fact check me, getting you to research it on your own. So you're not ignorant of what's going on around the world. When I say the word ignorant and you call somebody ignorant, that's not necessarily a degrading thing. It just means you don't know. Ignorance means you don't know. I'm ignorant of a lot of things in life, areas of life that I have no I have no knowledge about. But I don't want you to be ignorant of what's going on around what's going on around the world. I don't want you being ignorant of the social, political, and biblical things. And I'm going to do my best to try to bring those things to light, to get you thinking, to get you talking, to stir you up. That's my goal. And so sometimes we just don't know. We don't know what's going on. But here's the thing I will tell you. Once you know, then you know. And when you know, then you will know that you will be held responsible for what you know 
and what you do and what you don't do. I hope that made sense. Because when you know, you know, and when you know that you know, now you know that you're going to be held responsible for what you know. (laughs) I dare you to try to say that again. There's actually, I mean, it's really called responsibility. And And the reality is this. Ignorance only goes so far because of consequences. Consequences of the law, consequences of your decision. I mean, the law is we reap what we sow. The law is whatever you give is what you get back. So if you're not putting into something, then that something's not going to be putting into you. Whatever that thing is, whether it's your relationship, whether it is your knowledge of this country, whether you go out and vote or not. I said last week, which is a very, very, very sad, sad t- statistic. And that is this, out of a hundred and, uh, well, I want to say it was like 40 or 50 something countries that have voting laws and whatnot, we're like a hundred, we're 142 on the list or maybe it's 137 and 142. It was in my rant. So you'll have to go look it up because I, I don't try to remember every statistic that I throw out there. I'm just telling you right now, we are pathetic in our country about getting the American people registered to vote and actually voting on voting day. It's, it's absolutely embarrassing. And I, and I mean, we reap what we sow. If we can't get our people to get out and have a voice in what's going on, then we're going to be making decisions with the 1% of the freaking population and the rest of us have to suffer. I saw a post that uh, somebody did. I won't say the name, but it was it was actually it was astonishing to be honest with you. They were a guy was going around like a man on the streets and asking specific questions about. They asked how many continents do we have in the world, and they couldn't answer the question. They literally asked the question: uh, "Is is uh, Idaho? What they say?" What I forgot how they said it. They said something about Idaho, and they didn't even know Idaho was a state. They asked who was involved in the Civil War. They asked how many presidents have we had. They they asked uh, uh, what is the capital of Chicago. They couldn't even answer that. Hello, hello, Chicago is not a state. How is it going to have a capital? I mean, it's not hard, but people didn't know the answer. They literally asked what three times three times three was, and they couldn't figure that out. I mean, we're not talking difficult here. It's not that difficult. They couldn't, they, many of the people couldn't even tell you what countries border the U S they couldn't even tell you what continent we are on. So I guess when you're thinking about people voting and these are adults, maybe we don't need them voting. Uh, I don't know. What we need to do is educate people. That's what we need to do. We literally need to educate people. I don't think our school system is doing a great job at educating people. They're focused too much on the other crap that doesn't need to be talked about. And what we need to be doing is educating people and, and helping people have knowledge about what's going on in this world because it is really, really sad that people do not know how many continents there are. It is really sad that they did not know that Idaho was a state. It is really sad that they did not know that Chicago didn't have a capital. I mean, we're, we're talking whatever. They didn't even know anything about the Civil War. I mean, they were talking about the Nazis and Germany and France and war. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you people, what is wrong with you? These are not really tough questions. And listen, there are a lot, of, like you, I would be, dates would get me. If you try to tell me uh, when something happened, I could not remember a date. That's different. Well, at least for me, it is. Some of you are history buffs and you remember that stuff. My son is like that. But information wise, I could tell you what went on and who the war was about and those kinds of things. Anyway, I've got this, I just got this, feel like I've got a calling in my life to share my thoughts and some biblical truth to the things that we face daily. That's the bottom line. And again, I don't know it all, but it does get us thinking. And I, and I know we have to take responsibility when we don't know something. 
or absolutely when we do know something. I just feel like our world pushes blame on everybody today, and they don't take responsibility for anything. Nobody wants to take responsibility for their actions. They don't want to take responsibility for their choices. They want to blame everybody else but themselves. And you can't help people that don't want to look at themselves for their own problems. You can't do it. You can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make that horse drink the water. Today, it's time for us to drink the water. Today, it's time for us to take responsibility for us. Today is the time for us to learn how to be better at being us. So when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about confirmation bias and how it affects us in our decisions and in our choices. You're listening to Unfiltered on the Real Talk Radio Network. Okay, we're back from the break, and I'm ready to dive right into this first topic of confirmation bias. But before I do, just let me remind you of Roots Cafe out in St. Clair, Missouri. Yep, that's our cafe here at the church. I encourage you to come, have a panini, have a coffee, have have a, a bread bowl, soup, salad. We got all of it. This segment sponsored by Roots Cafe specifically, and we're going to talk about confirmation bias. Are you ready for this? But first, let me tell you this. When I talk about things on this radio show, I know that there are a lot of people that are judgmental. They're critical. But I want you to know that not everybody is going to agree with what I say or even how I say it 100% of the time. They're not even going to agree with you 100% of the time. My show sponsors don't necessarily agree with me 100% of the time. My kids, even my wife does not agree 100% of the time. And it is completely okay. I'm not sure why people are so pious and prideful to think that everybody has to be like them or everybody has to agree with them. That is not how this thing works. We are going to have differences. We are going to have a difference of opinions. And that is okay because that's what makes America great. That's, I mean, think about it. This is the way that God has made me. He's made me this way. He's made me passionate. He's made me um, straightforward. And I'm not even as straightforward as I used to be. I have way more sense and compassion than I, than I used to have. But this is the way God has made me. And it doesn't mean, though, that I can't change. It doesn't mean that I can't learn. But I mean, as far as my approach, as far as my personality, I'm not changing. I'm not changing my personality for the sake of someone being offended at what I say. I mean, I could say, you know, your personality offends me because you're weak or because, you know, you you're compassionate and maybe you're too compassionate, in my opinion. Maybe that offends me that you won't say something that, you know, needs to be said. But I've learned not to let those things offend me. I've learned to understand that's who you are. That's your makeup. And we need people like you in this world. We need people that are sensitive to help people like me who are insensitive sometimes. I don't try to be, but I do become insensitive to people when they know what to do and they don't do it. I don't have sympathy for people like that. I've got compassion towards them but I don't have sympathy for them. And that's just the way God has made me. But I was designed this way by God to be the way I am, just like you were designed by God to be the way you are with your personality, your demeanor, and the way you share information. So what does all this have to do with what I'm talking about? Well, all has to do with confirmation bias. Do you know what confirmation bias is? Do you even, do you allow it to affect you? Because let me tell you what it is. It is a cognitive bias that causes people to search for favor or to interpret and recall information in a way that confirms their already pre-existing beliefs. 
That's what it does. If you already have a belief, all right, that means you're going to already favor information. You're going to search for information. You're going to recall information that already confirms what you already believe. Like, for example, if someone is presented with a lot of information on a certain topic, the confirmation bias actually causes them to only remember the bits and pieces of information that is already confirmed with their thoughts. And the confirmation bias influences people's judgment and decision-making in many, many, many areas of life. So it's important for us to understand it because it's going to affect you. It is absolutely going to affect you. The confirmation bias, it promotes various problematic patterns of thinking, like people's tendency to ignore information that contradicts their beliefs. So they have a biased search for information. They have a biased uh, favor of information. They have a biased interpretation of the information. They have a bias of a recall of the information. And there's different types of confirmation bias. Like someone who searches online to supposedly check whether a belief that they have is correct, but ignores or dismisses all the sources that state that it's wrong. So they literally can believe something, but there's a ton of information out there that proves them wrong, but they will not look at that information. They're only biased to the information that they're looking for. And it's dangerous because it also can form an initial opinion or impression of a person that someone else has told you about. So you've never met the person, you know nothing about the person, but the, uh, another person has had an encounter with them and they begin to share their experience with you about the person you don't know or the person you didn't meet. And then all of a sudden you meet the person and because of the little bit of information that's been given to you, you begin to have confirmation bias towards the person that is, begins to say things. And all of a sudden, you're now thinking that they're one way when they're really not. It's pretty messed up, actually. It's pretty dangerous place to be if we're not careful. Like, let's talk about people with political views. Okay, people generally prefer to spend more time looking at information that already supports their political stance, and they spend less time looking at information that contradicts it. That's what we do. We want to know, and we got to find information that supports our narrative. We don't go looking for information that doesn't support it. That's, that's the confirmation bias that happens towards us. It's no different in your friendships. If you want to do something, and even though you might know it's probably not the right thing to do, what you will do is you will shop for answers from people till you finally find someone that agrees with your narrative, and then you stick to that one thing. And that is pretty scary. We have to start being careful about the way we think about things and the definitely the way we think about people. To me, it matters way more when you already have this thought about a person. And even if it's your own experience, if you have a bad experience with a person, you have to be careful to not let the confirmation bias to continue to control the narrative of how you feel about that person. This person could change dramatically, but because of all your experiences of maybe when they weren't changing or when they were trying to change and they couldn't figure it out or whatever that is, this person could completely do a 180, but because of your confirmation bias, you never give them the chance to change in your mind because your mind only goes to the things and thoughts that you've had about the person for the whole time you've known them. And it is, uh, it's an extraordinary, powerful mindset that we have to overcome. So, I don't know. It's just a thought. Have you thought about it? There's a, there's a lot of psychology that goes into this that causes confirmation bias. What happens is, and I only have a, a, another 30 seconds in this segment, but let me help you with two things. Confirmation bias can be a, attributed to m two main cognitive mechanisms. That is the challenge of avoidance, which is your desire to avoid finding out why you're wrong. 
and you also have the reinforcement seeking, which is the desire to find out why you're right. And that's a battle between the two. And these forms of motivated reasoning can be the problem of people's underlying desire to minimize their bias. We got to take a break. We'll be right back in just a minute. All right, we're back. Let me go in to this finish out the confirmation bias talk for some of you that say, okay, great. You've told me what it is. Yep, I recognize I do that. Now, how do I fix it? Well, there's a couple things that you can do to try to overcome the conf- confirmation bias in your life to help you have better experience it. Um, you need to make it that the goal is to find out the right answer rather than to defend your existing belief. Try to find the pros and cons of both. Allow the information from both sides to form your opinion rather than allowing your existing belief to supersede what you already believe. That's one way. The other thing is you got to minimize the unpleasantness and issues associated with finding out that you're wrong. It's okay if you're wrong. It's okay if you thought one thing and it turns out to be something else. I mean, we do need to probably give the people the benefit of the doubt. We also need to encourage people to avoid letting their emotional response dictate their actions. I mean, you should never allow your emotions to get the best of you. Our emotions are not steady. They're all over the place. They're like yo-yos, up and down, up and down. One day you're good, one day you're not. One day you feel good, one, you know. No, no, no. Try to allow the truth to control you instead of your emotions. We believe as Christians that the truth will set you free. That's what I believe. I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute. We also can encourage, um, I want to encourage you to give information that is su- sufficient for consideration. When, you, when it comes to avoiding the confirmation bias, it often helps to engage with information in a deep and meaningful way. And since a shallow engagement can lead people to rely on biased intuitions rather than on proper analytical reasoning. So you got to have sufficient consideration. And then I want to encourage, then we need to encourage people to avoid forming a hypothesis too early. Instead of just automatically coming up, when somebody tells you something, when you read something, I mean, just take the news, for instance. Take, take the things people share on Facebook. We read that and all of a sudden, boom, we form a hypothesis that they're right and this is what's happening instead of us actually diving into what the information is to see if the people are, are saying what they're saying is true. And then give people a chance to explain the reasoning. Why do you believe the way you do? I mean, think about that. I've asked people, why, you know, biblically, why do you believe that? Well, that's because my grandma told me that. Well, that's not a good enough reason. Your grandma could have been wrong. Your mom and dad could have been wrong. Your boss could have been wrong. You know, your news media or your news outlet could have been wrong. Not everybody's right about everything. But give people at least the chance to explain why they believe what they believe. I think that could be helpful. Oh, there's a bunch more. I don't want to get in too deep into it. I think what I want to tell you is just you got to be careful about the confirmation bias. In your life, you don't want to have confirmation bias control the way you think and feel about people. That's for sure. All right? Does that help anybody out there? We are in the meat and potato segment, and I want to talk to you about five things that Jesus never said. But they are five things that people believe Jesus said. I'm going to help you. Here's the first one. I got 10 minutes to get through these. I think I can. The first one is Jesus, or let me, let me back up. Let me, let me read it how I wrote it. All right. Here's five things Jesus never said, but these five things are things people believe he said. Number one is follow your heart. Jesus never said, follow your heart. He said, follow me because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? I've heard people say that 
before. Well, you need to follow your heart. Well, Jesus said to follow your heart. No, he didn't. He said, follow me. Jesus said to follow me. And the reason why is because Jesus is solid. He's foundational. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he tells us that our hearts can be deceitful and they could be wicked. And he says, who can understand it? Only God can understand it. We can't. Here's the second one. Be true to yourself. Guess what? Jesus never said that either. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their own cross and follow me. He never did say, be true to yourself, be who you are. No, he said, you have to lose your life in order to gain life. It's no longer your desires. It's God's desires. So you have to deny yourself. Take up your cross, which means you have to bear your cross. You have to carry your cross, which, which simply means all the stuff that goes on in your life, the things that are not good, you got to carry those. But Jesus says, come to me, those who are weary and heaven burdened, that I may give you rest. You don't need to do this on your own. But you are going to carry it, right? You're going you're gonna to carry it, but Jesus is going to help you through that. So it's not true that Jesus said, be true to yourself. No, Jesus never said that. He said, follow me. If you are, are, I'm sorry. He said, if you want to be my disciples, you got to deny yourself and take up your own cross and follow me. Here's another one. Jesus said, believe in yourself. He never said that either. Jesus said, believe in me for I am the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the father except through me. I'm not saying you can't believe in yourself. I'm not saying you shouldn't believe in yourself that you can do something, but don't make you God. Don't make everything about you and what you believe is the the thing because that's not what he wants. Jesus said, if you believe in me, he said, believe in me. And when you believe in me and you know that I am the way, the truth, and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through him, that is going to liberate you to understand that you do need a Savior. Here's the fourth one. I'm getting through these a lot quicker than I thought. I hope they're helping you. That's all I'm trying to do is just help somebody. Help, help, help. Oh, this is a big one. How many of you have heard live your truth? <coughs> yeah, I've heard, I've heard Oprah say it. Live your truth. Guess what? Jesus never said that. When Pontius Pilate questions Jesus about the truth, Jesus said to Pontius Pilate, I am the truth. And when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Jesus will set you free. You can't live your truth because your truth can be messed up. It's not the way of God. The people that are out there that think that it's their truth, that I'm no longer a male, I'm a female, or a person that is a female that thinks they're a male, and they live that truth, the truth that they are attracted to kids, and that's okay because I'm attracted to kids, that's sick. That is not that is not the way of God. I can tell you that right now. You don't live your truth. Because here's the thing. Where do, you, where do you get your standards? Where do you get your metrics from? How, how do you know what your truth is? How, how do you learn what truth is for you? Where are you getting your information to give you some kind of standard? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Christians, we get ours from the Bible. And if you're not a Christian, you're not going to understand that because the Bible isn't for you. The Bible is not for an unbeliever. It is for a believer. And the Bible was written, okay, understand this. It is many books put into one called the Bible. It's a bunch of letters that were written by these people from the, the scrolls that they that they found and went through a very rigorous process to be put into the Bible to make sure that these letters were true, that there were witnesses that, yep, I, this is what exactly what happened. And they made a book called the Bible. They did that for us believers so we can learn from what Jesus was telling his disciples. That's what it's about. You don't live your truth. You live the truth. I don't get my truth from the government or from you necessarily. 
or from myself even necessarily. I get it from the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? I want to try to line up my life with what the Word of God says because that's the truth, and that truth will set me free. It'll keep me out of trouble when I know the truth. That's what the Bible says. All right, here's the last one. Oh, man. The last one is, as long as you're happy, that's all that matters. Jesus never said that. He said, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? Or what can he give in exchange for a soul? That's what Jesus said. A lot of people say, we just want to be happy. If you're happy, that's all that matters. Jesus never said that we'll always be happy. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, we're going to go we're going to have tough times. He says it. He says when trouble comes. Not if. He says when it comes. You're going to have problems and when you have problems you're not going to be happy because it's not about being happy. Doesn't mean he doesn't want you happy. Of course he wants you happy. I want you happy. But when you're not happy, that's what you got to be careful about because then you start to do things to make you happy and those things don't last. They're temporary. And that is why Jesus says to eat from my flesh and drink my blood because that's what gives life. And he's talking about the word. The word of God is the flesh. In the beginning was the word and, you know, the word was God, the word was with God and the word is God. It's who he is. And I don't want you to get lost in your happiness because, you know, that whole phrase, oh, this drives me crazy. That phrase, a happy wife, happy life, that is crap. That just means that you're, as long as you do whatever you're, you know, to make your wife happy, she's happy. But then when you don't do it, she's mad. And then the whole family is in a mess. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Not even all. And it don't go the other way either. That's not what this is about. And I don't like the statement. I understand it, right? I understand that's just a statement people use, but they use it in the wrong way, and I don't like it, and I think it's wrong that a happy wife means a happy life. Because what happens when your wife's not happy? Now you just based your whole marriage off of her happiness, and then you teach her to do the same. It's not about that. You're going to have trials. You're going to have temptations. You're going to have struggles. You're going to have adversity. You're going to have all those things. But Jesus says, well, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? What good is it to be happy and have everything in the world, have money? Of course, if I won that $1.7 billion, that would have made me happy. But maybe what good is that, have $1.7 billion when I can't take it to heaven and then I don't know God and I'm not living for God and then I die and then I don't go to heaven? What good is that $1.7 billion anyway? I can't take it with me. I can't take it to heaven and I can't take it to hell. And that's what he's saying. He said, what good is it for a man to profit the whole world but lose his soul? It's not. It's not about that. Of course I want you to be successful. Of course Jesus wants you to be successful. But it shouldn't be the main thing. I know a lot of great successful people who have pretty much anything they want, but they love Jesus more. And they they give of themselves. They give of their finances because that's what it's about. So those are the five things that a lot of people think that Jesus said, but he never said them. He didn't say follow your heart. He didn't say be true to yourself. He didn't say believe in yourself. He didn't say live your truth. And he didn't say as long as you're happy, that's all that matters. Jesus never said any of that. So I just want to make sure you understand that. All right. We got about 20 seconds left. So here's what I'm going to tell you in the last segment. In the last segment, please don't go anywhere. We're going to talk about something in the last segment that happened years ago. They've taken it away. I think we need to go back to it. You want to know what it is before we go to the break? You want to know? You want to know? I'll tell you what it is. How many of you remember the blue laws? The question is, should we bring them back or not? We'll talk about it here in just a minute. Yeah, yeah, we're back. We're back. We're back. And we are on the last segment of the show for today. Man, time goes by fast. 
I really hope that you enjoy the show. Hope you enjoy some of the topics. Listen, if there is a topic out there that you would like for me to talk about, maybe you already know the answer. Maybe you want that information to get out to someone else through this radio show. Send me a text. Put it in the chat on the app. Let me know what that topic is. If you want to text it to me, the number is 314-924-4215. Again, that number is 314-924-4215. Send me a topic that you want me to talk about if, that, if, that, if you have something. I'd love to talk about it. It don't have to always be what I want. I, I, I'm all ears to, to hear what you want to talk about. And maybe I can talk about it. Maybe I'll have a different thought than you would. Maybe I'll learn something from you, and maybe you'll learn something from me. But let's talk about bringing back the blue laws. Ha! I, this got brought up, and I don't even know where it came from, honestly. It's been several weeks ago. <clears throat> I was going to talk about it, I think, on last week, but we got into the whole Israel thing. That's why I saved it for this week. And I think it's just, um, I mean, you had... You, I don't remember it because it happened in the late seventies. Uh, I believe it was late seventies when it when it kind of was in effect, and I I feel like I remember it a little bit because I was born in seventy five. Uh, I'm trying to see exactly. Let me while I'm talking to you, uh, I'll see when was the blue light law, blue law, not blue light, but blue law. Um, I, I want to say it was early seventies. I'll find out while we're doing this. But my thing is, it's actually a pretty good, um, a pretty good thing, in my opinion. And I and I actually want to ask you: Do you think we should bring them back, the the blue laws? And if you don't know what they are, let me tell you what it is. It's pretty simple. Um, on Sundays, stores were closed on Sundays. That's it. That's the bottom line. There was no restaurants. There were no stores open. I think the only thing that was open was a gas station, but the gas stations back in those days weren't like an on the run or a uh, Bucky's, you know, they're, they're not like that where you can go in and get food and, and shop and all that stuff. They were just gas stations. That's it. You, you just got gas. Uh, and so on Sundays, that was a day for the Lord. That was a day for your family. That was a day that you rested and they took that away. And I understand it, right? I mean, it, it all becomes about the money. All becomes about how much money we can make. And that's another day we can make more money. And people want to do things on Sunday. They get out and do things. The problem is you're taking away from the people that need to take a break. Some people are working seven days a week. They don't need to work seven days a week. I mean, there's a lot of businesses that are not open on Sunday and they survive. <coughs> Excuse me. Chick-fil-A is one of them. Hobby Lobby is another one not including a lot of other stores out there that are just not open on Sundays. A lot of businesses are not open on Sundays. I mean, my business is not open on Sundays. I don't work on, on Sundays. Some days, well, sometimes we'll work on Saturdays. And you might say, well, you're a pastor. You work on Sunday. I don't work on Sundays. I work through the week to prepare for my Sunday. My Sunday is a serve day for me. I serve on Sunday just like the volunteers serve. They work all week. And they come in on a Sunday and they serve. They volunteer. That's what I do. I'm paid to, to sit in an office, to read books, to study scripture, to manage the church, pastor the church, care about people, all those things, all the things, the job of a pastor. That I do through the week. Sundays are my day to speak the word of God, to come in and worship just like the rest of you. And then I want to go home and relax. I want to hang out with family. That's what I want more than anything is I want I would love for the blue law to come back. That's my opinion. I don't know where you are. Let me know. Would you like to go back to when things were not open on Sundays where it forced you to be at home having lunch, breakfast, dinner, whatever it is, with your family, going to church, making church a priority because it should be a priority. It's only an hour for most places, hour and 15. Sometimes it's an hour and 20 at our place because I go long. But I tell a lot of stories, man. I'm telling stories. So would you want to bring them back or not? Put it in the chat. I want to know right now. Do you think we should bring back the blue law where everything's closed on a Sunday except gas stations? I think that would be my stipulation. Well, of course, hospitals, you know, EMS, fire, 
<clears throat> all that stuff needs to stay open. I'm talking about the functionality of restaurants. Um, I'm talking about uh, just places uh, that you go to, you hang out at on a Sunday where, where you, we should be at home resting. I'm in favor for it. That is my opinion. Again, I, I'm not saying it's going to make or break anything, but I just think it would help our society with some mental illness. We need mental wellness, not illness. And the way you get mental wellness is by resting, taking your mind off the day-to-day, -day, going to church, handing over your problems to the Lord, trusting in the Lord, going home, spending time with family, communicate with your kids, hang out with your kids, do thing with your do things with your children at home. That's what I believe needs to happen in my opinion. I'm reading here most blue laws have been repealed in the United States. Both labor unions and trade associations associations have historically supported the legislation of blue laws. Although many states ban selling cars and impose your tighter restrictions on the sale of alcoholic drinks on Sundays. So, yeah, car, car lots aren't open. That was one. And I know it was in the late 70s. I'm pretty sure it was the late 70s when it ended. It, um, And I want to say it was in the early 60s when it started. I could be wrong. Somebody could, you know, correct me. I'm trying to find it, um, but I can't. And, and, you know, I don't want to try to speak out about something I'm searching for when I could be wrong about it. But I do know that blue laws were a thing back in the day. And I thought, I thought it was very healthy. It, you know, it made you do, it made you plan a little better. You know, right now, if you, if you forget something, you can just run to the store on a Sunday and pick up whatever you need. Don't matter what it is. So it would help us plan a little better. I think we should plan a little better. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, there are times that I like a store that is open on a Sunday but let me tell you something. If you know it's not open on a Sunday, it's going to change your thought. It's going to change your mind about going and running up and getting something. You need to plan the day before, plan the week before. So here's, here's what it does. It reduces. I'll give you just a, a few things, three or four things that it does, in my opinion, okay? One, it reduces Sunday traffic. I mean, think about how peaceful it would be on the road if you were traveling Maybe you got on your motorcycle. Maybe you were just out driving the country roads, whatever. There would be a lot less traffic. The second thing it would do is give you more time to spend with people and not spend on people. <laughs> I think uh, more people would go to church if things weren't open. I think more people would share a meal with family and friends if things weren't open. That's just my opinion. I think it also gives a break for people that are in the industry working, especially in the restaurant industry or like a, an event situation. Somebody said, well, what about uh, football games? Well, that's a great question. I mean, there's been football on Sundays forever. I'm not saying you take that away. I'm, and I know that you might be like, well, yeah, but so you're going to do this, but you're not going to do that. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, because I just think if you if you can cut back on having things open on Sunday, it allows people uh, to go to church a little bit more. But, you know, which is obviously the most important thing is to have a relationship with God, go to church, worship corporately with your, with your family. But really the other thing is to allow us the time to just spend with our families and relax more than anything. There are days we just need to relax and do nothing. You know, whether it's boating, go boating. That shouldn't cost you anything. Go get gas before you go, before the Sunday. Or, and you can get gas on Sunday. Remember, you just, you know, can't go shopping, can't go to the mall, <clears throat> can't go to a restaurant. Well, anyway, I just thought I'd bring it up. I'd like to see what you guys think about the blue laws. Bring them back or not? You like you like things being open on Sunday? You like being busy, 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 busy? Or do you think it'd be good to have mental wellness if we brought back the blue laws? 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time we have for today. Don't forget to support my show sponsor, Silo Restaurant in Sullivan, Missouri. Check out the Roots Cafe in St. Clair, Missouri. Come check us out at church, at Roots Church. We have three experiences, two on Sunday, one at 9 in the morning, one at 11 in the morning, and then one Monday night at 7. Just come and see. Come and see what we're all about. And next week, we'll see what kind of topics we're going to bring to the table. Let's see if you submit any topics to me. But either way, I love you guys. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Thank you so much for listening. Have a safe weekend, and we'll see you guys next time.